time. But still, I always feel there's something missing. Oh, the seats are comfortable. And the acting is wonderful. But the stories aren't true to life. Why don't they make pictures about ordinary people? Things happen to ordinary people, too. Things like, well, take me, for example. My name is Ernie Finch. I'm a cigar salesman out of South Bend, Indiana. And what happened to me was... Well, as you all know, the war to end all wars wound up in the fall of 1918, and the armistice changed my whole life. It killed my wife's Uncle Fergus. Uncle Fergus had a small sausage factory and a big war contract. And when the armistice came so suddenly, he also had a stroke. I guess he died of a broken heart because he only had one year to sell bologna to his country. But they buried him close to where he'd always wanted to be, in the neighborhood of $100,000, of which my wife Ella and her kid sister Kate got $30,000 apiece. Well, time heals all wounds, and life was good. Everything they promised me about the post-war world had come true. I had my wife. My wife had money. I had a good job. My wife had money. Katie had money. And Katie also had her steady boyfriend, Willis Gilby, a clean-cut American butcher. Yes, life was good enough. But I guess Willis wasn't. Katie needs a higher type man than Willis. Only she'll never meet any in a place like South Bend. Where else is there, for instance? For instance, New York. New York City, that's where. Heard of it. It's the only place. It's the big town. That's where she'd have a chance to meet someone with, with money and position. It's just as easy to fall in love with a man like that. You mean you'd let a sister of yours marry for money? I know a sister of hers that wouldn't mind if she had. Well, as far as I'm concerned, couldn't find a better man for Kate than Willis. It isn't just Katie, it's us. What are we getting out of life? Here we are, the three of us, with $60,000 between us, and are we having a good time? Yes. You. Your idea of a good time is taking off your shoes. But I want to see life while I'm still young enough to enjoy it. That's why I want us all to pack up and go to New York. Well, I don't want to go to New York. I was born in South Bend, and when my time comes, I want to die in South Bend. You think I'm throwing up a good job just to gallivant around New York and spend money? It happens to be our money. Yes, and all you're going to get for it in New York is grief, only you'll pay more for it. Well, we're going. And if dying in South Bend is more important to you than showing me a little happiness, then Kitty and I'll keep in touch with you from time to time. But when they started buying clothes for the trip, I knew they were really going, with me or without me. And without me, Uncle's nest egg wouldn't last long enough to hatch. So what could I do? I said I'd go with them. But I didn't quit my job. I told my boss, A.J. Gluscoder, that Ella had a rare disease, and I wanted to take her east to a sanitarium. He was very sympathetic. Business is terrible. But a wife comes first. If you only knew how tough things were here while you were overseas, decent, red-blooded he-men smoking cigarettes instead of cigars. Yes, cigarettes. <laughs> That's what the war did. Uh, something's got to be done about the sales department. I've been thinking very seriously of taking you off the road and putting you in charge of the home office, Arnie. With a raise, of course. You were? Yes. But a wife comes first. We'll discuss that when you get back. Sure. Sure, when I get back. So, you see, I, I gotta get back. And soon, too. Well... I know I'm only a butcher, but at least it's clean work. Well, the thing is, we can't take this lying down. Willis, customers. Yeah, right away, Gussie. Gee, and I had such wonderful plans, too. There at the end of the rainbow was my own little butcher shop. Well, listen. Sooner or later, those dames are going to get fed up with New York. And as soon as they do, I'm going to send for you. Now, when I send for you, you drop everything and get there. 
because if you're around when the crash comes, I got a hunch that uh, we'll all be coming home together. Well, you just send for me and I'll be there. That's 268, Ernie. 268? You robber. Life. We were on a slow train and we had plenty of time to work up an appetite. My two heiresses didn't wish to be the first ones in the dining car, and they got their wish. Why don't you do something? By 8 o'clock, my two charges were like wild animals. And when the wealthy dining car steward held up two fingers... That's right. I didn't have any more chance to stop them than if they were the whole Notre Dame backfield. Thank you. It wasn't more than 10 minutes before they were gabbing away with one of their messmates as if they'd all been to Princeton together. Even from where I was standing, I could tell that this was a citizen of New York. You couldn't miss it. Everything about him was sharp. The cut of his collar, the knot on his tie. The way he had of looking at people as if they were side dishes he hadn't ordered. One place. When the coach finally sent me in, the first team was so busy swapping lies, Ella never did remember to introduce me. As far as hotels are concerned, the ballroom is the only place for you to stay. It's right in the center of things, you know, the great wide way. That's just the kind of a place we want. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't quite catch the name, which it's barely possible my wife doesn't know yet. And I know you don't know mine, because it uh, probably slipped her mind for the moment. <laughs> Isn't that silly of me? Ernie, this is Francis Griffin from New York. Mr. Griffin, may I present my husband, Ernest Finch? How are you? Have you been in New York before, Mr. Finch? Uh, just for a couple of hours. Well, when you've lived there a while, you won't be happy anywhere else. Yes, sir, give my regards to Broadway and tell him I'll soon be there. <laughs> well, not on this train you won't, but uh, that's a good line. I'd remember it and give it to George M. Cohan. <laughs> ah, good old Georgie. He can have anything I've got. Oh, and those songs of his sure kept our spirits up in the darkest parts of the war. Where were you? I was in the shipyards painting troop ships. Where were you? Well, I, I'd have been there if I could. Yes, sir, there were no slackers in the big town. Oh, I'm sure there weren't. No, America will never forget New York for coming in on our side. Go ahead and order, Ernie. Oh, yes, uh, I'll have the victory blue plate. Yes, sir. You and your wisecracks. He's very nice. And besides that, he's in Wall Street. Last year, he cleared $20,000 in commissions alone. Well, he's a fiker. Most of them don't even think in less than six figures. Oh, you never believe anything. Why shouldn't he be telling us the truth? Didn't he buy us our supper? True. Of course, I've been buying you breakfast, dinner, and supper for over five years, but that doesn't prove I'm knocking out any 20,000 per. You should have seen the way he looked at Katie in the diner. He looked as if he wanted to eat her up. Everybody gets desperate in the diner these days. But you know, he thinks our $60,000 won't go very far in New York. I doubt if it'll get as far as New York. What made you clam up on him? After all, you'd known the man over 20 minutes. Why didn't you confide in him? Oh, hello there. Hello. You know, we were just remarking how well you two young things seem to be getting on together. We were wondering what on earth you could find to say to each other all this time. Well, uh, just now, I think we were discussing you. Your sister said that you'd been married for five years, and I felt like calling her a fibber. I told her you looked as though you were just out of high school. Oh, Mr. Griffin, you New York men are such flatterers. <laughs> 
The wife tells me that uh, you're on the stock exchange. Well, only in a small way, but they've been pretty good to me down there. I knocked out 20000 last year. That's what he told us in the diner. There's no reason for a man to forget that kind of money between Elkhart and Cleveland, even on a slow trade. Well, 20000 isn't a big income in New York, but I managed to get along and have a little fun on the side. Oh, but I, I suppose it's enough to keep one person? Of course, but they say two can live as cheap as one. Uh. <laughs> Not my two. <laughs> <laughs> didn't take us to the Hotel Baldwin, the place he recommended, because he had to beat it down to Wall Street to sit on the curb or something. And it was then that we had our first contact with a foreign language spoken only in New York. Hey, Mac, I can't wait your day to choose up sign. You want a hack or don't you, hey? Beg your pardon? What you waiting for, two cents plain air? I gotta make up up two, hey, so make up your mind. Either you do or you ain't. the scenic route to the hotel. And we saw all the sights Ella had wanted to see. The famous building they called the... And we passed the... And most impressive of all, the... And we arrived at our destination convinced that New York cab drivers are... to tell us that in New York the convention season is all year round and the Baldwin is pretty crowded. But we got a regular big town welcome. New York hotel clerks have an answer for everything. No. This joint's a joint. What's the matter? Well, they won't give us anything without a reservation. They won't give us a reservation because we don't manufacture corsets. We gotta go someplace else. But Ella figured that as long as we'd gotten a tip on the place from Wall Street, it called for a small investment. It seems Francis had wised her up to a little New York game called Grace the Open Palm. How do you do? I'm Mrs. Finch. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Finch? Yes, we have your reservation. Two rooms with connecting bath, $15 a day. Thank you. And for the first time they played it, the heiresses made a nice score. They're going to give us two rooms with a connecting bath for $15 a day. Give us is good. Francis didn't get around to calling us that night, so the heiresses decided that I should take them to a fancy restaurant on Broadway where they could see some light. From what I can see, everybody in New York has the same idea. And they all get it at the same time. It's another local game, on the order of football. Only the use of the knee is encouraged. And New York people are so careful about keeping their sidewalks clean. They all walk on tiptoe. Yours. So we finally fought our way back to the hotel dining room where we learn something else about New York. Everybody is very polite. Excuse me, what time is it? That's not my table. And on every side, all you see are helping themselves. Helping themselves. Oh, hello again. Hello. with somebody with some packages. Help me! Oh. Get him, get him, get him. What did you do with yourself all day, dear? Window shopping. Leave anything in them? Will you take off that silly thing? If you don't mind my asking, how much did you spend today? Well, we're 
shirts a new length and all. Things are awfully expensive. That is, nice things, you know, like suits and hats and things like that. But don't forget, it's our, our money. money. Yeah, well, how much of it did you spend? Oh, not quite $1,600. Oh, but it's money well spent. When Francis sees Katie tonight and every other night from now on, we're going to get mighty quick returns on our investment. <laughs> this much before prohibition. <laughs> here, maybe this will help. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Something for you right here. There you are, my girl. Oh, you. <laughs> but I wasn't too drunk to enjoy dancing with you, sis. Boy, we make a great team. And that Francis is pretty foxy, too. Dancing all night with an old married lady just to stand in good with the family. I don't know. He's changed. He acts kind of shy lately. He didn't hardly say a word to me all last night. <laughs> or tonight either. Well, if you're both through talking for a minute, maybe I can tell you something. <laughs> While Francis and I were dancing, he asked me to go with him tomorrow afternoon to look at a little furnished apartment he's thinking of renting. And he wants me to come without Kate because he wants to surprise her. <gasps> oh, he did it. Yes, he did. <laughs> Oh, yes, he did. Well? It's really quite nice, Francis. I like it. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, how about a glass of sherry? Where's the kitchen? It's right in there. Oh, yes. But Katie won't mind. Oh, you're getting a real housekeeper. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> That's sweet. Where's the bathroom? I mean it. I can't wait. I can't wait to carry her across the threshold and take her in my arms and kiss her. <laughs> Sorry, darling, I lied to you. But I'm glad. I'm glad. It's been you all along, Ella. I'm mad about you. Mad about you. Mr. Brown, we have time yet to... you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, but just send it the way it is. There's no extra charge for ten words, you know. It costs the same as one. Yeah, I know, but just send it the way it is. Okay. Don't you even want to say love? No. No extra charge for love. This fella I'm sending it to, it happens we're friends, not sweethearts. What is it, in code? My friend will understand it. I don't understand it. I'm not sending it to you. Would you just send it the way it is? Look, maybe if you explain it to me, I could help you phrase it differently. It's phrased fine the way it is. What's the matter? Don't you trust Western Union? Look, Senator, I'm paying for ten words. But you send it just the way it is there. Put the other nine words on somebody else's telegram. Hmm? And don't take it to heart. Wise guy. What do you mean you wired Willis to come to New York? Just what's he going to do after he gets here? Well, um, now that Griffin's disqualified, <laughs> I, I mean, at least we know who Willis is crazy about. 
Well, wouldn't it be nice to see a familiar face? Your face is familiar enough. We don't need Willis Gilby. So you just better send him another wire and tell that butcher boy to stay right where he belongs. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in South Bend, A.J. Glasscoder was writing me threatening letters. Consequently, Arnie, in view of business conditions, I do not know how long the home territory can continue without an active manager. A word to the wise is sufficient. Yours truly, etc., etc. Uh, wait a minute. There's a postscript. P.S. My best to Ella. And if you have a moment, please give some thought to our suggested new slogan. A woman is only a woman. But a good cigar is a smoke. Well, there was a housing shortage at the time, so naturally, Ella decided that what we really needed was an apartment on Riverside Drive. Gee, I thought we were going to save money eating home-cooked meals. Oh, fine. The only cooking being done around here is done by the delicatessen. Well, now, Ernie, it's really much cheaper that way these days. You know eggs aren't 34 cents a dozen anymore. And butter. <laughs> and do you have any idea what a sirloin steak is? No. What is a sirloin steak? I want to sound choosy, but I'm getting pretty tired eating dill pickles. With dill pickles. Talk about experiences. I just had a ride home. And it wasn't on a streetcar, and it wasn't on a subway, and it wasn't in a taxi, and it wasn't on a bus. Broomstick? Oh, tell us about it, sir. A limousine. And whose do you suppose it was? The man next door. His name is Trumbull. He's seen you around the building, sis, and he's just wild about you. Oh, a limousine? Well, well, what's he like? Stunning. Tall. He wears dandy clothes. And he has the cutest little mustache that curls <laughs> up at the end. Oh, that's cute. How can we eat? Oh, sis, how old is he? Well... He's the kind of man where you can't tell how old they are. Oh, but he's not old. I'd say he was... Well, maybe he isn't even that old. But he must have lots of money. And I don't think he's married either because he said he was keeping bachelor quarters. Well, and he's not only rich, he's got brains. Now, can we eat? Will you have a little patience? This part will be of interest to you, I'm sure. Mr. Trumbull's invited us all over for some drinks tonight. I acquiesce. Oh. Now, can we eat? <laughs> Say, outside of uh, living in the lap of luxury, what does this guy Trumbull do for excitement? I don't know. He's a man about town. But he said he travels a lot and collects things. Antiques. Oh, how do you do? And I thought it was one of Mr. Trumbull's antiques. But it turned out to be the man himself. Oh, yes, he was a man about town, all right. But the town had changed a lot since then. Still, he and Kate did have one thing in common. Fifteen years ago, they'd both gotten a new set of teeth. Only he had to pay for his. But from the minute he saw her, he couldn't take what was left of his eyes off her. Those sisters are very charming. You had your choice. You couldn't lose. You're a very lucky young man. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's a nice place you got here. Mm -hmm. Looks like we both got done by the same decorator. Different ways, of course. Oh, no. I picked these things up from various parts of the world. Now, this is a Persian prayer rug. At least a thousand years old. What do you think I paid for it? Well, uh, for a first guess, $20? Oh, you have a wonderful sense of humor. This rug cost me $2,500. Persian of Solity had a wonderful sense of humor. You're very droll, very oh, droll. You're, uh... Look at that! I wish I'd been nicer to your mother. Isn't it horrible? <laughs> what is it? I, I think it's just terribly exciting. Yeah, there's quite a history connected with that, but if you think that's horrible, come, I'll show you something. Come this way. Yeah, that wonderful? Hmm? Aren't they wonderful? Coconuts? No, no, no. Shrunken head. It's a hobby of the Congo pygmies. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, this is a wonderful collection. 
The missionary who gave me this one here told me about the northern pygmies. Said they are wonderful people. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I'm going back into the interior. Oh, I mean the living room. Huh? Uh, uh, yes, uh, let's all go. Trumbull, you've lived. You think so? Shall we uh, join the ladies? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you uh, don't think anything I've said might have upset them, do you? Oh, no. You don't understand those kids. They're the greatest little headhunters you ever saw. That's so. Oh, uh, say, what's this? Oh, very interesting, these. These dice were carved from the tusks of the sacred white elephant of the Maharaja of Jengapur. Cost me $200 apiece. Up till now, you mean, huh? Mm -hmm. I tell you, it's your house, and these are your dice, so you should have first roll. Oh, I see. Well, just for a few times. Twenty-five dollars be enough to start with? Uh, Tusks, we were invited here tonight. Don't make me pay for the entertainment. You're faded. No offense. Oh, no, no. Two, do I win? <clears throat> well, Katie, what'd you think of Whistler's father? Oh, shut up. And you said he wasn't old. <laughs> Who do you think you are, Will Rogers? And you had your nerve shooting dice all night? Well, what else was there to do after we ran out of shrunken heads? Well, let me tell you something. He's at the stage where he's very attractive to women. Ah, uh, money isn't everything. It's no crime. And at least he's sophisticated and, and he's polished and he's been everywhere. And he's a lot more romantic than some younger and more uncouth individuals I know that aren't a million miles away. Romance? After five years of marriage? But if romance was what she wanted, romance she was going to get. shouldn't have sold the old sofa. It was worn out and it creaked. But it still had a lot of wear in it. Can't we forget about Trumbull for a while? Ah, Annie. <laughs> and for your information, Mrs. Finch, we never sold the old sofa. I put it in storage. Ernie, you didn't. Uh-huh. Yep. Think maybe now I'm not so... Unromantic, after all, maybe? Ah, uh, darling. Sweetheart. Yes, dear? Why don't we pack up and go home to South Bend and really be happy? I had a letter today from A.J. Glusskoff. For your information, Mr. Finch, we're staying. We're staying. We're staying. And I haven't forgotten what you said about Sweetheart. And shut up! And so we started going places with the ancient mariner. Katie acted as if she were afraid old age was catching. I don't think she likes me. Oh, give her time. She's just a kid. Yeah, but what a kid. He's too fresh. He squeezed my waist. How do you ever find it? <laughs> hey, listen. If you'd ordered breast a guinea hen at 7.50 a throw on me, I wouldn't have stopped at your waist. I would have gone for your throat. <laughs> Finally, Ella thought it was time for the two young things to be alone. Just a moment. I want you to come to my apartment. I have a big surprise for you. Hmm? Well, I don't know. Oh, I'm, just a moment. I'm, I'm, it won't take a moment. 
great surprise for you. Do you like it? Oh, Mr. Trumbull. Isn't that beautiful? You shouldn't. Oh, it's nothing at all, but I have another wonderful surprise for you. Why should we go out to a crowded restaurant and be waited on by insolent waiters when we can have a wonderful luau right here in my apartment? I don't know. What's a luau? Oh, you'll love it. You'll love it. A luau is a Hawaiian banquet. Wonderful food. See? Real Hawaiians. I got them in Greenwich Village. <laughs> oh, you love Hawaii. I'd like to take you there. The trip across the Blue Pacific is absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. I get seasick. Oh, no. Not on the Pacific. It's just like a sea of glass. Here. Uh, these ladies are a symbol of friendship in the Hawaii. Aloha. 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 Cute. The dinner's ready. Shall we sit down, uh, Hawaiian style? Aloha, aloha, aloha. Ah, oh, here we are. <laughs> this is wonderful. This is the cup that cheers. Oh, this is beautiful. Here we are. To your beauty, my dear. To your beauty. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, hmm. What is it? It's Hawaiian punch, but it needs a little more punch. <laughs> through that wonderful brain of yours. That was the best salami I've tasted in New York. Wonderful girl, wonderful girl. Aloha. 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 Where are they going? I want more music. Oh, we can get music with it. I'll take care of that. Never mind, I'll take care of them without those fellas. There we go. couldn't make it. So we moved back to what was fast becoming our favorite hotel, the Baldwin, just in time for another convention. Oh. Oh. My name Finch. This time we got him reservation. You had him reservation? You're 25 minutes late and we've canceled you out. Oh, now, wait a minute. You can't... Pardon me, folks. The voice belonged to a guy who looked like he belonged to a horse. But this was no ordinary cowboy. Can a stranger be of any assistance? Look, I'm sure you can find some... Then he introduced himself as Herbert Daly and told us he owned a lot of racehorses that were running in Jamaica. 
he and Kate gave each other the kind of looks you could pour on a waffle. And once more, the matrimonial sweepstakes were on. Ever watch them improve the breed, man? Been to the horse races, I mean. Oh, we just love them. is over in about a half an hour they have another one but i don't see how that improves the breed well uh people bet money on the races you see. oh but that's silly betting money on one horse running faster than another horse <laughs> who cares shucks and friday man betting is folks way of showing they got faith in something at the proper odds of course do you have any faith in the next race i got a horse in it that's the best in my stable coyote and I don't mind advising you folks to bet with me. Oh, but we couldn't take your money, Mr. Daly. After all, we're your guests. You're betting with me, not again, me little gal. We all place our bets with the bookmaking. It's his money we take if we win. Oh, but is that fair? I mean, the bookmarker doesn't know how fast your horses can run. <laughs> they should by now. I've done pretty well this season, and I hope to do a lot better. Well? Got a better, aren't we? Of course, silly. Only let Mr. Daly handle our bets, because it's his horse and he knows about these things. And besides... I know, I know. I'm the spendthrift of the family. Can't be trusted with money. Well, come on, pard. Let's go find a bookbinder. I'll bet my own money. Thank you, ma'am. Excuse me. Isn't he wonderful? He's just crazy about you, too. You look so cute in that big hat, doesn't he? <laughs> Hi, girls. Oh, hello. Nothing to worry about. Good. All well, right. folks, I put a couple of thousand coyotes, pretty little nose, and 20 for each of you gals. How wonderful. There for a uh, little advanced celebration? Why, shucks and Friday, sir. That's again the vaults today. So am I. Ernest? One thing about prohibition, our children will never know the taste of alcohol. That's if they'd enforce it. I sure wish they would. It'd save me a lot of worry about my boy. Your boy? Oh, I call him my boy. I mean my jockey, Sid Mercer. Oh. <laughs> He's the king of them all when he lays off the firewater, except he ain't too long in willpower. <laughs> Number five. Beautiful, beautiful. You've got wonderful taste in colors. Not only in colors. <laughs> oh, Mr. Dale. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. I always let Kyle to know when I'm around. <clears throat> special friends of mine, Mr. Mrs. Finch and Miss Goff. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. Hello. That was great, Sid. I'm going to give you a bonus for that ride. Thanks, boss. And I thought you were just wonderful, Mr. Mercer. And I used you there, ma'am. Oh, and I just love your little outfit. Oh, that's last year's. But I know you're in the stands. I'd have won my new one. <laughs> uh, uh, when do you ride again, Mr. Mercer? Not till tomorrow. But I can give you a good tip on the next race. Really? Yeah. Put on yourself. I beg your pardon? I'm talking about a little filly named Sweet and Pretty. Oh. It's about time for the third of that. We'd better go. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. Well, so long, everybody. Bye, Mr. Mercer. 
Just call me Sid. <laughs> He's kind of cute. Oh, but then I suppose he does have trouble finding girls his own size. <laughs> Reserve this a table at the finest steakhouse in Long Island. Oh, how wonderful. But tonight it's our treat, isn't it, dear? Oh, uh, yeah. No, it yeah. ain't. Party's on me. I picked up a neat, nifty 10,000 today. Well, shucks and Friday, if you insist, partner. Gee, I'm sorry, but I've got a date tonight. Oh, it's just the boy I met here when we first came to New York. Uh, Sherman. Eddie Sherman. You remember him, sis? Well, he called up and just insisted I have dinner with him tonight, and, well, I just had to say yes. Well, I wasn't very hungry anyway. She's a little fool. Just because she knows he's crazy about her, she starts playing hard to get. Say, who is this Sherman, anyway? Who is this Sherman? Shucks, some Friday, man. That's what I want to know. And he certainly can't be as good a catch as Daly. Well, when last seen, the bankroll was galloping rapidly downhill in the neighborhood of $17,000. No, sixteen. <laughs> Don't know how Katie's is doing, but it can't be much healthier. I think this is her now. Are you crazy, gal? The first thing you know, Daly's going to get good and mad and walk out on you. Look at her. Just who is this Sherman, anyway? Oh, that's just the name I made up in front of her, but it's really Sid Mercer. <laughs> Sid Mercer? Do you mean you're fooling around with a jockey when Herbert Daly is ready and willing to give you everything you could ever want? Sid's making more than enough to support a wife. Oh, and how that boy can dance. <laughs> dance? Listen, I'm not married to either one of them yet, and I don't know if I want to be. Well, you're not going to have a chance to marry Daly if he finds out about you and Mercer. I knew it. Excuse me for breaking in on you, but I just got a wire and I got to go down to Louisville on business. Oh, I'm sorry, Herbert. How long will you be gone? About a week. But I've left word for you to use my box at the track whenever you want. But Kate, I'd like to have a word with you alone. That is, if the folks don't mind. Oh, of course not. Listen, Katie girl, I'm more at home around the rustle of cattle than I am around the rustle of skirts. But you know how I feel about you. And when I come back, there's something I want to ask you. So while I'm away, how about forgetting this uh, Sherman? Oh, he doesn't even exist. Oh, Katie girl. Just a minute, Mr. Glasgow. You forgot this. I hope you have a nice time at the convention. Nice time. And don't you go smoking those cigars in my special humidor. Oh, I'm Mr. Glasgow. I wouldn't think of something. All right, thing. now, now, now. I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm saying these days. You can smoke them. <laughs> Left at the post. Well, good night, Sid. Thanks for a lovely evening. Wait a minute, honey. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you for a minute. You know, I've been asking you something all night now, and so far all you said was season's greetings. You know we'd make a great entry. How about it? Gee, it's late, Sid. It's never too late to try. I'd really show you the life, baby. The whole works. Pimlico, Aqueduct, Belmont, Churchill Downs, Hof de Gras. You say the nicest things. Just you and me, kid. I could be one big happy mile in a furlong. We'd go from track to track, booting them in together. Can't you just see it, Katie? I put the crack of dawn and down at a rail. You with a little stopwatch in your pretty little hands. Me up on some beautiful bang tail, knocking seconds off the track record. Oh, 
for you. All for you. Now, what do you say, sugar? What's your best bet for tomorrow? You. Tomorrow and every day. Come on, Sid, I'm serious. Hey, you really got it bad. But that's good. Tomorrow, the words on it, a pig called Fragrant Flower. Right in the nose. Then, of course, on Saturday, it's me and Coyote in American Handicap. You can bet your bloomers on that one. Sid, <laughs> you're terrible. Now, but you haven't even... Good night, Sid. Oh, good night, Katie. <laughs> Time, I guess. We were going to have a talk together when I get back, weren't we? Well, I guess this is as good a time as any. Well, I guess so. I want you to be very happy. Sid's getting a wonderful girl, and you're getting a fine boy. Of course, it'd be a shame if it happened again. Yes, it would. If what happened again? You mean he didn't tell you? Well, then forget it. I wouldn't want him to think I betrayed his confidence, especially about a thing like a prison record. What did he do? You mean the first time or the second time? Oh, never mind. It's not important. He's a grand boy. After all, it's his hot murderous temper that makes him the crackerjack jockey he is. If only he didn't drink so much, that is. Well, I won't have any use for this now. I want you to have it anyway. I hope you'll invite me to the wedding. Wedding? What wedding? Why, Herbert, you haven't been taking me seriously about that, that silly little man. Oh, shucks and Friday, Herbert. I've only been seeing him because, well, I was lonesome here with you away. Shucks and Friday, gal. That's what I wanted to hear you say all the time. <laughs> So this guy starts winking at my girl. I said to him, buddy, if you gotta go around winking at people, you should be wearing blinkers. He says, I ain't winking at nobody. I got St. Vitus dance. So I unloaded my equalizer and I manicured his toenails. For that little thing, I got 11 months. And this rat daily has to come along and make a big thing out of it. Bust me up with Katie. Well, that's a tough break, Sid. But you got me down here to square you with her. I don't know. Square your shoulders. Sit down. We'll have another. They said before you couldn't square nothing. But I can. You think Daly's a pretty straight guy, don't you? Well, would you like to know what he once told me about you and your missus? Mm -hmm. Never mind, uh, Sid. I'd rather not eavesdrop. Well, he said, and I'm quoting him verbatim, that you and your missus were just hanging around waiting for a free room and board when he married Katie. And then he said that the only meals you'll ever get from him will be served in a saucer in his back porch. And that if you ever get sleepy, you can make yourself up a lower one of his stables. That's your pal Daly for you. He said that? I don't believe it. Sit down. Here's another thing. You think Daly's so square, don't you? Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret about it. If you swear to keep it under your hat, you swear? Listen, sir. I swear. Go on, swear. I swear? Put up your right hand and swear. Okay. Okay. Your friend Daly in conjunction with a big gambling syndicate he's been working with, I put the fix on the merit tomorrow. The fix? That's just what I said. Well, so long, Sid. You gotta hear this. Listen. They have got it fixed. Every horse in the race to lose, except Coyote. So who do you think I'm betting on? Hmm? 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 
Coyote. <laughs> Daddy only thinks he's got it fixed. But I'm gonna unfix it. You understand? I'm betting on a long shot called, uh... On a bright. Now, ordinarily, Lily, his and I couldn't run from here right across the street. But I just kind of got a hunch. So I'm betting on, on a bright. And I think I can convince some of the other jocks to do the same thing. You don't really mean that, do you, Sid? I think so. <laughs> The day of the Merrick dawned bright and clear, which was more than I could say for my head. But I thought I'd better tell Daly what was up. Hello, Annie. Mr. Finch. Mr. Hooper. Mr. Crosley. Mr. Hemingway. Hiya, bright boy. How do you do? Uh, uh, could I speak to you for just... Sorry, Ernie, I'm busy now. If it's about betting for the gals, you can take care of that. Just put it on Coyote's nose to win. Uh, yes, but... Please! Uh, I... Well, I did try to tell Daly, but he wouldn't listen. The only trouble was the girls had told me to bet all their winnings on Coyote. $2,500. But if Mercer was going through with his double cross, there was no sense betting on Coyote. Could I trust him? Was it gonna be Coyote or Honor Bright? Honor Bright or Coyote? Because if Coyote won, the girls would expect me to show up with 10,000 bucks and no excuses. I didn't know what to do. It all depended on Mercer and what he was gonna do. Gave me the wink, all right. But what did it mean? Coyote or Honor Bright? Honor Bright or Coyote? Oh, hello, AJ. Having a nice time, aren't he? Yeah, very, very. Well, you'll excuse me right now. I have to go and do something for Ella. Oh, is Ella here, too? Yes, big fan, big fan. Well, see you around. So this is the sanitarium you had to take your wife to, and this is why you can't come back to South Bend. Finch, you're fired. Well, I finally made up my mind. I didn't bet for the girls at all. I took a chance and bet $1,000 for myself on Honor Bright. The nag that ordinarily couldn't run across the street. There's Coyote, number two. Mercer's going to give him the ride of his life. I know he will. Excuse me. Well, the race got off to a perfect start. Coyote was left at the post. But I guess Mercer couldn't hold it. He probably forgot to tell the horse what he had in mind. <laughs> At the quarter, it was Coyote, Playboy, Baby Doll, Carla F., and Honor Bright. But it still looked like anybody's race. Anybody but Honor Bright. At the half, it was Coyote, Carla F., Playboy, Baby Doll, and... Honor Bright. But when they reached the far turn, a strange thing happened. All of a sudden, it looked like the whole field was running in slow motion. All except Honor Bright. With him, you couldn't tell the difference. 
And here comes Honor Bright. Honor Bright. And when they hit the stretch, Honor Bright made his bid. He thundered into the lead. But how he stayed there, I'll never know. What stamina. What a fighting heart. What a lucky thing the fix was in. Right one in a driving finish. <laughs> I can't understand it. I need, I need water. What? Still can't figure out what happens. I'll tell you what happened. You told us Coyote couldn't lose. You made us bet all that money. 2,500 lost. That's what happened. Oh, shut that fool face, John. I'm sick and tired. I'm getting oh, back. You can have your ring back. I don't want it. Something go wrong, bright boy? Something you forgot to tell your pals about? Hold on, partners. You don't think that I had... settled, I put the money I'd won on Honor Bright in a safe place. And I didn't tell the heiresses anything about it because it happened to be my money. Yes, yes. Huge. You stay here at the hotel. Oh, I do hope you meet him. Oh, I stay too. So funny. Don't excuse me. Guess who moved in here yesterday? The five flying flugelmeyers. No, a real celebrity. Jimmy Ralston, the comedian in the folly. Oh, go on. What would a folly star be doing in this flea bag? I don't know, but June Moon knows him, and she saw him check in yesterday. Really, sis? Yes, and she said he's the funniest man you ever saw in a party. Gee, I'd like to meet him. Oh, not just because he's on the stage, but... Oh, it must be such fun just to sit and listen to him talk. Oh, sis, I bet he's in the stage. Well, she met him all right. For a comedian in the Follies, he didn't look very comical right there. Oh, Mr. Ralston, we were just talking about you. Well, watch your language. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, sir. Yeah? The papers have been good to me. I suppose I'm worth more than the thousand a week Ziggy's paying me, but I don't need money to make me happy. Well, it's true that a person can live pretty cheap at this hotel. Cheap? I didn't move here because it was cheap. The only reason I left the Ritz was to get away from the autograph pass, not save money. I don't save any money here, either. Got the best suite in the house, bedroom, living room, bath, and study. What are you studying? The things I really want to do. Well... 
why don't you join us in our suite for supper some night after the show? Tonight, maybe. We could have some food and some liquor. I'll let you know. Of course, uh, an actor needs no liquor. The theater is stimulant enough. Enough. Well, uh, if you'll pardon me, I got to uh, show Cantor how to put over that number in the second act. Now, remember, we're not going to make him talk about himself. We'll just make him feel at home. <laughs> then maybe he'll open up and be funny. Gee, I hope we don't wake up the whole hotel laughing. Welcome. What a cramped quarters you got here. I got held up at the city, didn't have time to change. Jolson was uh, bothering me for some gags again. Oh, does he pay you for them? I wouldn't take money from Jolie. He's like a brother to me. He can have anything I got, I can have anything he's got, only he hasn't got anything I want. Uh, no, girls, we mustn't make Mr. Alston talk about himself. Boy, my mother could certainly cook a chicken. Is your mother here in New York? No, she was killed in a train wreck. I'll never forget when I had to go down and identify her. You wouldn't believe a person could get that mangled. No, my whole family's gone. Never saw my father. He was in the pest house with smallpox when I was born. He died there. My only sister would die to join us. And <laughs> Excuse me, I don't want to wake up the whole hotel. There ain't a theater manager in New York who knows this business. Know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna quit the follies, that's what. I'm gonna star in a serious play written and produced by me, that's what. Why should Ziegfeld get rich on me, paying me a measly 800 a week? When did he cut you 200? It was 1,000 the last time we saw you. Are you working on your play now? Oh, it's all done. I'm just trying to make up my mind whom is the right party to let in on it. Whomever it is, I'll make them rich. I've got some money to invest. Why don't you tell us about it? Oh, I'll do better than that. I'll go up to my study and get the script. It'll knock you dead. Oh! Oh, boy, what a play. I don't know. I don't remember when I've ever laughed so much. Now, listen. Just because you expected him to go through his act. Well, he's not the kind that shows off or acts smart. He's too much of a man for that. He's a bigger man than I thought. I'm beginning to think the same thing. You needn't make fun of him for getting faint. There must have been something in that last court. Finer investment in the world than a hit show on Broadway. Oh, I don't care about the money. Uncle Fergus left me 30000 and I've still got most of it left. There are more important things than money. Darling. Uh, what'd you say? I said I didn't care about the money. But Uncle Fergus always said that he thought I had a lot of talent for the stage, and... You know, I think perhaps he'd rest easier if he knew I was proving he was right. I guess the only way I'll ever be really happy is if I make his dream come true. You know, I want you to be in my play. I'll coach you. Why, with your looks and brains and my coaching, you'll be a great star. Oh, Jimmy. What? But it won't cost all that. They figured it'll only take five or six thousand to get the show started. We gotta do something. You'll do nothing. The show's bound to be a big success, especially with Jimmy in it. And don't forget, he's giving up a six hundred dollar a week salary to prove his faith in himself. Hmm? That's what he was really getting. I think he could prove his faith without her fifteen thousand. Can't you get it into your head that this is the best thing that ever happened to her and us? Now we can really settle down here for good. Travel around with real people. Stage people. We're going to get everything we came to New York for. You know, I was just now thinking the very same thing. Yeah, I know, Ernie, but... But, Ernie, 
Willis, listen to me. You've got to come to New York. You've got to have confidence in yourself. Oh, I got confidence in myself. It's just that I don't think I got a chance. Our money's almost gone. You got to do it. I don't even know whether I can get time off. Well, you've still got two weeks to arrange it. Now get moving. There's no finer investment in the world than a hit show on Broadway. Ask Katie. Of course, I could let the Schuberts put in the money I need, but what's fair is fair. They've got the student prints. Let somebody else get rich. I consider it an honor to invest in your play, Jimmy. Of course, it's all the money we have left, so let's not tell my husband about it just now, shall we? Okay. Good. A uh, good investment, I mean. Well, a big night finally came. Ralston did what they generally do on a first night. He sent out free passes to everybody that had a dress suit. And there are enough of them in New York to pretty near fill up a theater at that. Ella said that all the dramatic critics were there, too. And those are the babies that can make or break a play because they're very deep students of the theater and have exceptionally high standards. She pointed them out to me. There was scholarly George Spelvin of the Gazette. Alert Jeffrey Queel of the Express. Grave Albert Finnip of the Sentinel. And the most brilliant mind of them all, Waldo Orange of the Chronicle. Well, the curtain went up promptly. A half hour late. The time is July 1917, and there's a war on. Yes, Captain. Yes, Captain. Oh, Mum, it's, it's the Captain, and he's on his way home. All I can say is he must have called up from a phone booth on his front porch. After a brief nod to the audience, he finally recognizes his wife. Daisy. Right. How is our dear little one, Bobby? Well, Bridget brings in the little one, and two great actors come face to face. Tell me, Maisie, how old is he now? Two weeks. Hmm. Yes, General. Yes, General. Maisie, it's come. That was my general. We sailed for France in half an hour. And off he goes to win the war. Goodbye, Broadway. Hello, France. Bridget feels the baby on the first bounce while Maisie flops onto the couch and starts bawling. I know it. I know it. Oh! This is terrible. You shut a mouthful, kid! <laughs> In the next act, Maisie is entertaining what she says is an old friend of the captain's. So, in sprints Bridget with the evening paper. A troop ship has been torpedoed. I don't know. To me, it looked like Willard had been torpedoed. Oh! oh. oh. Uh, courage, my dear. Courage. Among the men lost is Captain F. Shaw of New York. <gasps> oh! This is terrible! And it's not getting any better! <laughs> The old friend of the captain is now an old friend of Maisie's. In fact, they're married. It's now the night of November 11th, 1918, and they're decorating a tree because there's only 45 shopping days left till Christmas. In comes Bridget with little Bobby, who has grown about eight feet in the last year. He wants to know what Santa Claus is bringing him. 
Probably a razor and a box of cigars. So in dashes Bridget with a late extra. Oh, Mom! The armistice has been signed. Dempsey was still slaughtering Willard. John! Oh! oh. oh. Oh, what wonderful news. So they all go off to tell the neighbors, and who comes in but our hero, Captain F. Shaw of New York. Who are you? I'm Santa Claus. I've brought you a papa. I don't want no papa. I just got a new one. So in runs Bridget without the evening <gasps> paper. A ghost! Quiet, you fool. I know I was reported missing, but it was another Captain F. Shaw who got killed. He was the lucky one! <laughs> <laughs> the mum is married again. I know. As far as she is concerned, I am dead and buried. And so, officer and gentleman that he is, out he goes into the night. Farewell. Well, uh, he's a rat to fire you, of course, but... Maybe it was worth five or six grand to you to find out about him before it was too late. Oh, and see the things he said to me. Besides, I put in the whole 15,000. What for? <laughs> there was only the one piece of scenery. And it looked like you bought that second hand from the Salvation Army. <laughs> well, there was the money for the theater, and there was the scenery, and then there was the stage hand, and the actors, and Jimmy's salary. <laughs> and Jimmy had to give 5,000 to the man with the idea. The idea? For what? That's fine. Just fine. That guy gives everybody in the world ideas for free, but when he wants one, pays a man $5,000 for it. Willis! Come on in, Willis. Look, Ella, it's Willis. You remember Willis, don't you? Come right in here. There's somebody who wants to see you. You take the first step and go. No, don't say anything. Oh, hello, Katie. Gee, I saw you in the show. I think you're wonderful. Ah, uh, what is life without romance? Katie finally got her butcher, and considering the price of meat these days, she was a very lucky girl. Well, there was only one more thing to be settled. How about it? Let's us two just mosey along back to South Bend. But you lost your job, and uh, we don't have a home there anymore. And... We haven't any more money. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <clears throat> you still have $15,462. Not me more! <laughs> oh, no. You two, all your money, did you invest in that turkey? <laughs> well... You remember that $2,500 you wanted me to bet on Coyote? I didn't bet it. Besides, I won $8,000 on that race. So, in your money and my money together, we still have a nice little mess, egg. You shouldn't put money in your drawers. Advertising, publicity, exploitation. <laughs> of our lives. We haven't even got the money to check out with. Bernie, why? That's all.
all I want to know. Arnie, why don't you want to come back and work for me? Hey, Jay! Hey, Jay! Hey, Jay! Next to nothing. Hey, Jay? Have a cigar! <laughs> So here we are back in South Bend, Indiana. I have Ella, Katie has Willis, and we have nothing. They say you have to pay for experience, and we certainly paid for ours, with Uncle Fergus's money. And you know, sometimes I wonder if he knew about all this, just what Uncle Fergus would do. Drop dead. Ah. Uh. 